My name's Carol Baxter. I was, um, I think a good place to start with introducing me is where I was born. I was born in a small sea, sea port called Port Marie in St. Mary, Jamaica, and of a large family, seven girls, eight girls actually, and a boy. And I think that's a blessing for me because it, it straight away gave me um, the skills to live with people. Um, uh, the kind of community of a family was really a good starting point for me. Um, went to school in Jamaica, got to this country at the age of 19, after what I look back um, on now as a brilliant education in, in the Caribbean in those days. Okay, so do you know if you wanted a professional title for me, be a retired grandmother, in all honesty. I have worked for over 40 years in and on behalf of the NHS, in the education sector and in the voluntary sector, but all in on behalf of health and education. Um, but um, Recently, I retired, I'm still doing um, bits and pieces um, to, to further the, the in my interests all around that field. But essentially, what takes up most of my time now is my, to be honest, my grandparenting. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you sent me your script, it got me thinking about what, what is activism, what it means. And uh, to me, it's all about compassion, because we all see what happens in the world. We, all, we see injustices and we see lots of things happening, but it's when we take action to relieve the suffering of others that activism comes in. In the health sector, it's called compassion, when you uh, take action to relieve the suffering of others. Um, so I came to this country at the age of um, 19. Um, uh, actually, I was on my way to West Africa. Um, it was the days of Black Power Movement, and I was very keen to, to be part of that movement, whereas parents wanted me to go to university in Jamaica, study there to study medicine. My view was very much around um, what can I do to improve access to services for people, poor people in Jamaica. So I had a strong sense from a very young age of inequalities. I saw it around me right there where I was born. I was, in actual fact, there was a, a slight, not a guilt, but a, an awareness of, that I was privileged. Um, in my own community, we had more than others did. We had more access to information, to education, to just about anything. Uh, and it made me um, develop a commitment to improving that access to people. So my activism started as a child um, and it, was, it, it, it manifested itself as compassion for others. So you would snatch the little child off the street. Oh, you couldn't do that nowadays, but to give it a bath and to make sure it was all right. When I saw poverty around me, it bothered me, it troubled me. And I knew I had the resources to change that. So it's that taking action to relieve the suffering, not just recognizing it, but taking the action. So that's, if you ask me, um, that's, the, that's how my activism uh, can be described. It's about taking action to relieve the suffering of others. Um, so I, I came to, um, at one stage, health was a big issue for me. And I think, it, 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 health was a big issue for me because mother, mother always thought, you know, it would be nice if you could become a doctor. Um, and yes, I did think about that for a while, but then I realised that was going to be limited to one-on-one -on -one care with people. And I was more about populations, about people and groups rather than delivering one-on-one -on -one services. So I thought, um, let me, let, let me go. It, it was also the days of the Black Power Movement, the 60s. And I thought, oh, I'd like to go to Africa. And the best way to get to Africa was via Britain, um, uh, and I looked for opportunities to come to this country. The Jamaican government was offering scholarships um, to people to study nursing, and that was my little opportunity to get as close as possible to West Africa. I had a, a Nigerian pen pill at the time. So I came to this country in 1970, actually New Year's Eve 1970, with a view of studying nursing um, just for a short period so I could get over to West Africa. So within a year, I'd saved up enough money as a student nurse to spend some time in uh, three countries in West Africa. And uh, the intention then was to go back and to the Caribbean, but I didn't. I came back and finished nurse, my nurse training, finished, uh, moved on to becoming a midwife and then becoming a public health nurse. Now, um, when I say nursing, uh, you know, I trained as one. I can't honestly say, and I'm saying this deliberately because hopefully people who knew me will see this video and realise I didn't really work for, for very long as a nurse. I trained as one. Where I did do most of my work was as a public health nurse, which is a health visitor. And it wasn't about populations and about working with communities and with groups. And it really gave me a strong sense of... Um, of uh, what, what was holding communities back. And I realized 
as I worked in those fields, that um, certain groups of people um, didn't have access um, to healthcare in the same way, didn't have the same experience of healthcare in the same way, and the outcomes for them weren't the same. That troubled me. That was wrong, and I took action where I could. I couldn't help it. That's the way I am taking action. Um, to and I did it via a number of means, um, primarily. Um, um, by my writing and uh, we can go on to talking about my writing in a little while. I brought some books just to share with you and to remind myself of a um, of, of nearly almost 50 year journey um, but um, primarily uh, ultimately by my writing. I went to school at the age of three. I wasn't quite three. All the children in my parish did because we were from St Mary and St Mary was known as a deprived parish. Deprived because the banana industry was finishing and we had nothing else to offer. The, finish, the fishing industry was depleted, the banana industry was finishing, and the government uh, gave the parish extra money to take the children into school at a younger age. And I was very, very privileged to start school, my family and all the local people, to start school much earlier than other children in Jamaica. So, and I'm looking back now at other people who've come from my parish in that generation. We benefited from that because we were a parish with, without resources and that initiative to give us a, 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 a step up the ladder. Um, so, the, I mean, I'm thinking about some of the teachers that we had there. It, they were principled. Um, they, I mean, the kind of, if, if you ask me what I was grateful for about the education I had, it would be to treat others as, as, as I expect them to treat me. That's the first thing. Uh, but not to be a pushover, just be able to hold my own ground. Um, so, I mean, quite often you think if you're treating people the right way that, you know, then you become a pushover. No, it gave me that tightrope, walking that tightrope balance of treating people the right way, but knowing when you're being pushed over and holding your own ground. And that's the, the best part of my education, both as a little girl in a, in a school from a small age, right through to going to a preparatory school in Kingston and right through to going to the sixth form in Kingston. Those are the principles that um, I learned. I also want to mention my school, Excelsior High School, which gave people a second chance. Uh, when I grew up, um, you know, you, your family had to be wealthy to get in some of the better schools in Jamaica. But Excelsior High School, which I'd like to celebrate now, gave people who didn't, didn't necessarily have the wealth but had the brains to get into school. It gave us a second chance and gave us such fantastic privilege. One of the things that I remember about my school, Excelsior High School, was the fact that I was sitting beside people who were blind, people who wore, used calipers, people who were deaf, and we were all learning together. And I think that's probably where I got my sense of equalities from, from people who, um, the, the idea of including people who would traditionally be on the margins of society into mainstream. And if, if I were to look back, I think that's where I got it from, right there in Excelsior. Forget about the two ones are two and the English and the history and so on, because you can teach anybody to do that. I'm talking about strong values, which I got from my education, brilliant. And if you were to look at my own family, my large family, we all, talk about this on a daily basis, how, how solid that education was um, uh, to make us, uh, to help us to be citizens of the world and to be, to be um, good, you know, nation building um, characteristics. I think I might have said earlier that I won a Jamaican scholarship um, to study nursing in the UK. Um, it was a way of opening up the world to me going off to West Africa, I mentioned that context, but when I, once I started nurse training, there were a few things um, that were, very, were clearly quite obvious to me, and one of them was um, uh, the, the fact that some populations weren't having access to the best care and services, and I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, uh, the other uh, issue for me was also about the importance of making sure that the training I got, I, I, had, I had planned to return to the Caribbean. And the worry I had was that some of the training I was receiving was not relevant to the people I was going to be caring for when I got back to the Caribbean, and that bugged me. So I began to raise issues and ask questions. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, so um, I was taught the signs and symptoms of a fracture, a pain, swelling, and redness. And I'm thinking, okay, so I can write that in an exam and I can get a tick for it, but how will I know if the, most of the majority of people in Jamaica would not turn red if they had a fracture? What, how would I, and I genuinely got concerned about whether I was being de-skilled or being educated. 
sign of jaundice, yellow skin. Well, how will you know if I'm jaundiced? And I challenged, I asked those questions um, perpetually in, in my nurse education to try and develop my own professional knowledge. knowledge. And then I realized that I'm going to have to do some work for myself because those questions were not welcome. They weren't seen as positive and nobody had the answer to them. Um, I don't know if there's anything you wanted any more you wanted to find out about the, this issue, but my own professional development in nursing started to look towards the equality side of things. And, I, and that pathway I took um, for myself, I became a midwife after that, um, trained as a midwife after that, and then trained as a public health nurse, because as I mentioned earlier, it was a population side of things that I was more interested in rather than the one-on-one -on -one care. And I'll, I'll tell you though, um, and this is a lesson um, about being you're about integrity and being true to yourself. I kept asking those questions, um, genuinely wanting to know how would you apply what you're learning in this setting to a context where people had different, different skin color. And it was skin color that was the issue. It, you know, it wasn't just language or culture or diet. It was about jaundice, um, uh, ruba, which means red, although language wasn't, it, it assumed that white skin was normal. And it worried me. Um, but I'll give you, um, I'll give you uh, an, an incident. I nursed a Jamaican man, a lawyer, a young lawyer, uh, the first real experience I had. And uh, the nurses, the doctors investigated him for days and days and days. Um, for they didn't know what was wrong with him. And the investigation took a stereotypical route where they were looking for disorders and diseases which only affected black people. And that fellow actually died prematurely because they were looking for the wrong sort of thing. And it, that worried me. That was, that, that was a kind of a, a you know, a, a stereotype. Um, however, going back to being authentic, which is where I, I um, said I'd, I'd tell you about the benefits of that. Um, when I w wanted to move on to university to, to do a, a degree, um, I had to turn to my nurse, my supervisors and my, uh, the head of school for a reference and I was very anxious because I thought, oh dear, I've upset them for the three years I was, I was being trained by asking awkward questions and I'll get a dreadful reference. That's what my thought was. However, when I went um, to be interviewed at the university, they told me I had, had one of the best references that they could think of. So, I mean, there's always, I'm never miss an opportunity to, cheat, to teach. Um, there's always something about being authentic and although they couldn't answer my questions and they found me awkward, they respected me for sticking to my guns, but also for making them think maybe about some of the issues that they ought to be thinking of. Um, I remember them saying, oh, no, 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 you've got the best, one of the best references you've ever had. They may just have wanted to get rid of me quickly by giving me a good reference, but it served in good stead. My progress, progress for university was to do an MSc in public, first of all, to do a public health nursing and then an MSc in public health medicine. And again, I, I felt like I'd come home then because I really began to f get a feel for what I wanted to, to do. I knew it was health. And um, so that was that bit of it was there. But how did I want to apply that? And it was to populations. And I felt really, really um, uh, at home with who I was and what I was delivering. Um, so that um, MSc in public health enabled me to become a health promotion specialist. And in fact, that's when and where I began to get a strong link with uh, Hume and Mosside and with the black community because um, I then began to look at populations, uh, look at where can I find community groups, how can I work with community communities to address their health issues. So I linked up with people, with the Catholic Centre, with Abyssindi, places like that where black people gathered together for our community and we did a lot of teaching. We did a, how those were structured, I can't remember now, but it, I knew there was a lot of teaching and exchanging of knowledge. Basically from my um, uh, work, as a, my training as a public health nurse and as a, uh, a public health specialist. My public health specialist work was very much around health promotion. So I remember over the years going to schools in particular as a part of my role, talking about health within communities, just for all communities. But of course, by in, in Mossad and Hume, communities were mixed, um, whereas where I lived, it wasn't. So I was able to apply that, that um, knowledge. People often think of activism as, as, you know, people going out on a limb and people, um, uh, how would I put it now, people um, going through a lot of struggles. For me, that activism was finding 
being able to make a difference and finding something that made me feel comfortable to work in and to being part of something good. Um, so that's what activism in Manchester did for me through health promotion. Um, you know, be, feeling that I can make a difference, bringing information and knowledge to people who um, v valued it and recognised it for what it was. How did I get into sort of policy um, development? I was approached by the DH. I don't know how they knew about, I'm just trying to think now about how I, I you know, I got onto their radar, but I was approached by the Department of Health to be involved in um, a project uh, which was about training in health and risk. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to reach for one of the books. So, so obviously the work that we, the work that we did, working with people in my side in Hume, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, informally, not necessarily formally, some of it was formal through my health promotion specialist role, led to publications such as this one, Healthcare in Multiracial Britain, which was um, one of the first books and um, of, of its kind, acknowledging um, the fact that healthcare wasn't a generic thing. You, you had to look at the, your, your, um, your populations. Uh, the other um, thing it led to, and this was directly as a result of um, working in Masai and, and um, being, there are two other things about working in Masai. One was the chair of Manchester Action Committee for Healthcare for Ethnic Minorities called Matchem. And the other was the African Caribbean Mental Health Service, both of which I, I played um, key roles in, one as director and one as a chair. But this book came very much out of discussions with local people, uh, the black nurse and endangered species. Because what was happening, you see, when, when people like myself uh, and other um, black nurses would challenge the system, would raise issues, um, we were um, seen as unpopular. But more importantly, our experience of being employees wasn't good. Um, and people, even far back as the early seven, late 70s, people, nursing, which is a popular area for a lot of girls, women from the Caribbean, was becoming unpopular. They were looking for other avenues because the health sector wasn't valuing their skills. So, for example, when I raised issues about BME care, um, rather than welcoming them, it was seen as unpopular, like I mentioned. So as a result of that, people are thinking, well, you know, perhaps we ought to look elsewhere. And I could see that. And that's why um, that was the title of this book, An Endangered Species, because we, people were beginning to vote with their feet out of the profession. So those are two publications, which I'm very proud of, but they came from here, from the communities here. They weren't something that, they, it wasn't something that came from me as an individual. It came from the people in Matchem, the people we talked about, talked to the people we interviewed, and it became um, quite a, a seminal, those two publications are raised, a seminal publications which are pioneering in the health sector. I would say, and categorically, that, um, and I would tell any young person now that Caribbean women built the NHS. And I say that for a reason. You probably know that Enoch Powell, at the time as health minister, actively uh, recruited women from the Caribbean to help to develop the NHS um, uh, as nurses and, and as other people in the health sector. So they were actively invited to do that. But then when you look at standards, you know, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to slip over to talk about individuals that you might have heard of, people like Louise Dacacodia. They're the women uh, who re helped raise standards. So people like Cherry Byfield, people like Louise Dacacodia who worked in the service. And they usually worked in areas which were seen as marginalised. Um, so if you were black, you were more likely to be a geriatric nurse looking after old people or a psychiatric nurse looking after mentally ill people or a, a nurse looking after people with learning disabilities because those are the areas mainstream. These are people on the margins who nobody wanted to work with. So BME people, black and minority people were pushed in those directions. And it was us, single-handedly, and I say that, who raised the standard of those services, who showed compassion um, and who, who began to, I know Louise in particular showed the, the kind of skills and high professionalism which raised the standard of services for people um, on the fringes of, 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 um, of society in this country. I was approached by the DH to, 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 do, to do some work on um, writing publications around healthcare in multiracial Britain. And I suppose once you start publishing, then you, uh, you get known then. And I was an avid reader writer. That's something I could do. And it's easy to do that 
because I, by this time I'm having a family now and so working from home and writing is always going to be one way of, of, of um, continuing to work while you multitask. And so that my work became known because I was publishing um, so much. So um, I remember being, being uh, approached uh, after writing Healthcare in Multiracial Britain, co-writing, I wrote it with other colleagues. Uh, I was approached by a number of other organizations to either do research on equality and diversity. That was the launch pad for me for equality and diversity, is that healthcare in multiracial Britain. Um, but once I um, began to uh, do work in that field, if, if, if posts, if roles came up um, in you know, jobs in the, either the health or the education or the voluntary sector, I would get information about, you know, would you like to apply for this job? It has an equality perspective in it. We know you, were, you have a track record in that field. Would you like to? And, um, and that opened up a whole world in terms of equality and diversity, which was for me an active choice. I mean, I wouldn't go advising people to categorically um, go and work in a field of equality and diversity, but because what you need is to have a strong foundation in something else and then to apply that to this agenda, which is what I did. So I applied um, my public health, my nursing. Uh, by then I'd done a PhD degree as well, um, my um, understanding of global public health. All of that, I applied it to equality and diversity, but purely by invitation. People invited me to either apply for roles or f to do particular projects, and I was able to apply that. Um, I suppose the, the there are two, I had two academic roles, uh, three academic roles, one um, University of Central Lancashire, then University of Manchester, and then Professor of Nursing at Middlesex University. And I would say that all of these three roles, um, which I applied for, um, I was able to, I, I, in a competitive way, I, I got these roles purely on the basis of my publications um, in the past around equality issues. So it, it it I was advantaged by the fact that I'd spent so much time being committed to the agenda that it made me um, more publicly known and therefore better suited to these roles when they were advertised. The, the one that really um, did it for me in terms of having a national perspective was when I became head of equality and diversity at the, the at, um, NHS Employers, which was the organisation for, for the employees in the NHS. Well, that was a fantastic role. It it um it was what basically that job was to um, manage a team which um, helped the 500 NHS organisations to become model employers, because by this time you see the NHS realised it had there was market forces about, and the NHS had realised it had to compete for staff with. Um, you know, women weren't just saying, I want to be my nurse because I'm a woman. Women are going into IT, they were going into medicine, they were going into, but well, not medicine, they're going outside of the health sector now. Uh, and the NHS had to begin to look at what it was doing wrong to compete in, with the market forces. So this role was to help the NHS to begin to look at what can it do better to ensure it, it had a good footing on the market to recruit from a wider base of people, whether it was gender, race, um, disability or whatever and my team um, was able to um, uh, begin to look at what equality and diversity meant nationally but also for an NHS organisation so we have seen the NHS improve in terms of its employment of gay and lesbian people at one time the assumption was 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 um, at one time those prejudices existed in society um, we supported um, the NHS in such a way that um, uh, so the NHS became one of the leading organizations, well some of the trusts in the NHS became leading organization in employ the employment of gay and lesbian people who did valuable work in recognizing the needs of all patients, but particular patients who were um, had shared experiences. Then, similarly, with um, disabled people, we, we helped the NHS to understand that disability um, didn't mean that you couldn't contribute to society. In fact, it's well known that uh, they, in heart surgery, and this is interesting for you, in heart surgery, um, packing of the of the, um, the heart surgery uh, instruments were better done by people who had a learning disability because it was repetition and people could just do it and do it and do it and not think and they're actually safer doing this uh, than you doing it for, pe for than people who 
didn't have a learning disability. So we were able to begin to get the, the NHS to understand that, you know, people are people and there's a range of people out there, whether you, whatever ethnic group you're from, whatever race you are, what your sexual orientation is, whether you had a disability, you had a part to play and you should be able to recruit from this wide pool because there's a role for everyone. And I think the NHS is a better place and I, I'm going to be, I'm going to say it as a result of some of the work my team did, a brilliant team in helping the NHS to begin to understand how to recruit from a wider base. Mm -hmm. What makes me proud of myself and my team, um, um, in, or the teams I've worked in, is the three, uh, three areas in which uh, equality has, the profile of equality has been raised in the NHS. One of them is in terms of the Nursing Hall of Fame. Um, so when I became, uh, when I was inducted into the Nursing Hall of Fame, it wasn't about me, it was about the agenda of equality and diversity, um, which was, a, 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 I took leadership in that area. Again, it's with my team. The other is um, my CB award in 2009, in the Queen's Birthday Honours List. It was for equality and diversity. And whilst I'm not a, a, an establishment person and wouldn't normally go around snatching CBs off anybody, I, I hold that CD with pride because it's for an agenda which is so marginalised and so, seen as so unimportant and um, I'm proud that you know I was part of that um, process. And the other is the Health Service Journal, uh, most dedicated and pioneering female leaders um, acknowledgement. Again, it was not me as a person but it was for the agenda that um, mattered really very much to me and I chose I choose to raise these because unless you lift that agenda up and make it and, and celebrate it and make it special uh, it will remain at the bottom so any acknowledgement I've had is around those areas and I'm proud of that because it's it pushing that agenda forward. For instance this this book The Black Nurse and Endangered Species was funded by the Department of Health and um, Can I just ask I bet that's what they were not expecting. They weren't expecting the the results that they got, but they they were they had, they were committed. They had to be committed to seeing it published. They I was working with the National Extension College then, um, uh, and uh, as a as an author, writing on this agenda, and I was well funded with my, my team and I, and we did the work right here in Mosside, interviewing people. Uh, most of it came out of the Manchester Action Committee on Healthcare for Ethnic Minorities. Um, most of the how we structure the interviews and the access to communities came via Matchem. And we, pu we published it and they just had to swallow it and take it. And, um, uh, but they were gracious enough to, to do that. Um, and it's about influence. Uh, you know, I'd say to people, if you can create compelling arguments that are clear and well evidenced and well put together, it's harder for people to dismiss it, and that's what we did. It wasn't me pontificating and ranting about inequalities. It was saying, here are the voices of nurses who've worked in the NHS, and this is their experience, and here are the people, um, and this is the impact it's had on their lives and on their patients' lives. And I think, you know, the DH was gracious enough then to have it published, and to, to and I, the pioneering bit of my recognition came from me being one of the first person. And I keep saying me, but you can imagine it won't just be me alone. Um, there was leadership, obviously, from, from my end. But for, for this kind of work to come out of, out of the community, the, the, it, it, the, they had to see that and recognise it. And, to, and um, it's a gift. They saw it as a gift and used it. And subsequently, I mean, this is the first book, everything else from that fell out of that. And funding, access to funding was much easier then because you'd created that compelling argument, because you had made, made it quite clear um, where your source of information was and because you'd made it, uh, it presented in such a way where it had to be. Making a compelling argument is always really important. So although, although I'm not going to cry and say I wasn't funded properly. I mean, I know a lot of the people in the black community said, oh, we couldn't get funds, blah, blah, blah. For me, um, it was them coming to us and saying, you know, can you do us something else here? I never had to apply for funds to do any, I, and I was never in a funding situation. Matchem was, Manchester Action Committee for Healthcare for Ethnic Minority was, but we were funded for, oh, I'd say maybe 13, 14 years. Um, and you wouldn't want us to continue forever because if we have to be as fringe organization crying for funds 40 years down the line, then we haven't been effective. So I, I must be honest with you, um, in terms of the health sector, there has been good response. At this level, I'm sure if you ask the patient, 
um, they may say things haven't permeated down you. But at this level of generating knowledge and information, uh, we've been sought out, or I have been sought out and, and funded um, in, a, in a way which has been helpful. Yeah. But when I left NHS Employers 2014, um, the organisation didn't want me to, I was ready to go, I was having grandchildren then and I had a bigger life, a more international life, I've got, um, wanted to get back to Jamaica a bit more often now and so on. And the NHS employers, when I approached them for retirement, said, well, don't retire just yet. What we could do, we could fund you to be an honorary research, to, to be a principal, um, however they put it, research fellow in um, uh, at Imperial College, um, where you could do some work uh, on, under our banner. So I did a, a very, um, we did a very interesting piece of work um, for NHS employers, but through um, the um, Department of Primary Care and Public Health um, at uh, Imperial College, looking at examples of good practice for equality and diversity across the country. We talked about evidence, looking for all the evidence that existed in the NHS of how equality and diversity initiatives had made a difference for patients. So again, um, you know, it was about uh, gathering information presenting evidence in a, in, a, in, a, in a compelling way, which, was, which um, then uh, created a situation where change could happen. So um, I did that for a couple of years um, under the aegis of NHS employees, but through um, Imperial College. I'm now an honorary professor there. I do, do some national work, I go uh, international work and do speeches on the, the topic on their behalf, on, on their aegis, but I don't. I'm not actively employed there. Okay. I was approached by the headhunters to, by this time I was already a trustee of a number of organizations, Center for Aging Better, I became a trustee of, it's not on your list there, but I was a trustee of Center for Aging Better, which is a, an organization looking again for evidence base um, for any initiatives, initiatives that work to make the lives of older people better. Um, I was also um, on the uh, trustee of Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion. So then I was approached by Arawak um, to become a trustee. Well, of course, it, it, I welcome that because it's for the first time now, I've wanted to come back local. I worked nationally for 20 years almost, and it was time to come back locally. So um, I applied for the role of um, a trustee at Arawak. And um, I'm only uh, six months into the role. Love it. Um, it. It gets me back into things, um, gets me back into the local scene. And it reminds me very much of the, some of the work I did with Louise, obviously, who was a pioneer in terms of um, getting that housing association up and running. I, I, I saw her, I worked with her, n not in any significant way, as I watched her, if you like, more or less, on the sidelines as she moved the Arawak um, uh, project from where it was. To, to what it's become now. So I'm proud to be a trustee of that. Mm -hmm. um, well, do you know, I'm going to, uh, if I'm honest with you, I'm going to say she was somebody who I more admired um, as a person. And um, I've had some links with her. I wasn't as fortunate as other people to have worked with her very closely. I knew her very well socially. She came to every party I had at home. Um, but um, there are, I've made a little note actually here of the number of things I've done with her uh, personally. One of them is in this book, um, and I'm going to have to fish for it if you don't mind. This one is called Issues and Services for People with Learning Disabilities from Black and Ethnic Minority Communities. Um, I thought Louise would be a good person to help me um, with this book. I was then a, a researcher at Bristol University. Um, a research fellow at Bristol University and my team was tasked with producing this book, researching it and I knew Louise would have a perspective on it from her personal um, experience but also from her professional experience. So I s went to her for some advice on what, um, what it was it could be the key focus for this book and she was really very helpful. So that was one um, way in which I worked with her on a project that I was responsible for. The other is obviously I knew her through her, so her role in the West Indian Sports and Social Club. I knew of her then, but she was, as I said, I was saying earlier, she had a whole life before I met her. I, looking back, I realized Louise had been um, a key person in the NHS, influenced an awful lot, awful lot of people in Tameside, and had started a second life by the time I met her. Um, but um, 
she approached me to do some to support her on a marketing of it must have been karaoke it, it must have been karaoke she she used to visit my house on a Sunday afternoon to talk about marketing well I said Louise I know nothing about marketing she said Carol please let us work together so we worked together on it for some time and then I found a young um, woman who was working in the NHS um, in the marketing department and uh, passed her on to Louise who did um, who gave her some support. I wish I knew how that all went, um, but I can't, I, I, I can't remember how it all finished. But she actively approached me to say, can we talk about market? How do we do some marketing and that? I was honored to be asked to um, do an address at, I think it might have been uh, an event in celebration of her life um, at MMU um, some years ago. And um, I began to reflect on my relationship with her. Then I gave, I think, a keynote speech there on women um, who influenced education um, uh, and I, I'm not sure if Louise was part of the Saturday School movement but I got involved in that I, I, not through Louise but her name kept coming up in terms of her pioneering work in the Saturday School. Saturday School I think came out of the Abyssinde work and I was one of the teachers or one of the organizers um, in the Saturday Schools with um, who was it, Judith and Barber and other people like that. No, no, but she was, she was a really, it's, it's a kind of older woman who I um, admired hugely um, and kind of, you know, aspired to be like and had, was fortunate to have a couple of um, close encounters with her learning disabilities and the marketing project. Mm -hmm. So what, what I admired about Louise was how articulate she was um, she, uh, just the way she presented herself, she had clear ideas about what she wanted, Louise did, and um, she was able to express herself very clearly. She didn't waver a lot um, in, in, when she had a view, I mean it's something I recognise again in, in my own upbringing, but which she nurtured and pulled out. It, she, she, she had a vision and she was able to articulate that vision uh, and to bring people with her to get it done because you don't, you don't get anywhere without bringing people with you. So those are the ways in which Louise has inspired me. Her being able to present a compelling, compelling argument for the things she, she wanted to do and to bring people with her to get them done. Mm -hmm. She gave as much to the voluntary sector as she probably gave to the, the um, public, her public sector life. She just devoted all her post-retirement years to community building and, and, and community initiatives cadre of women who just worked flat out. Lynn, Barbara, Judith Craven worked in, in, in that setting, um, all doing community education work. And um, it, as I say, I must go back to saying that, you know, you, quite often you, you get tempted to sing your praises about how hard you worked, but I think it's also how much fun you had and being part of something and, and seeing change happen and, and being able to, to make a difference. Uh, those are some of the names I remember. Abina, for some reason, I remember from Abyssinde because um, I spent a lot of time at Abyssinde just, just being and just sitting, feeling in, in a place where I was comfortable. Uh, I'd come in from Salford where I lived, where in those days it was completely, um, it wasn't multiracial at all, it wasn't diverse at all. And just sitting there thinking, yeah, I feel like I'm at home. And I remember watching them play the drums and watching them sing and really wanting to be part of that. And I remember, and this is supposed to be funny, Abina asking me to sing. And she could see how enthusiastic I was asking me to sing. And I think in retrospect, she was auditioning me to see whether she, I could belong, because I wanted to belong. And she said, oh, thank you, thank you, Carol, next. And she, that was it, I cannot sing. And she, <laughs> but she, and she, but she gave me that chance, which was, which was good, yeah, which was good. Um, so those are some of the women who, you know, um, uh, I wish I remembered all the names because, it, they, you know, there was Abina, and there was another woman with Abina. Um, Shirley. Shirley, Shirley Innes. Yeah. Shirley was, yes, yeah, Shirley was, I mean, like, those women were just there, there for each other. I lived in Salford. Uh, from the age of 19 and in from 1970 in those days it was not diverse so to come into a place where there are a group of women um, who looked like me who could do my hair who could feed me the food I was used to and just to sit with and be with was was just fantastic
can't remember how I found out about them, but I, I used to bring my children there just so that I can, they can see women who were sustaining, women who nurtured and who cared. For me, it was, it was just about being coming home, just sitting there and doing nothing, but sometimes being involved, sometimes not. But it, it, it was a sustaining factor for me. I could go back to work and it didn't matter what context I was in for the next two weeks, as long as I know on, on a Saturday. I could go to Abyssinia on a Friday evening. And the children remember it now. I mean, they're young adults and they remembered it now. It was like, it, for them, it was like, you know, it's time to go to Abyssinia, you know, come, come on, because it, it, it helped them to see black people in a positive way. We didn't have those little repositories of people at the time and women in particular, you know, in, 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 in their lives. So I had to, just to, for context, I, came, I was the only member of my family living in this country. So that was my family. When, when I was approached um, by Magdalene, I think that um, I wondered what Women of the Soil was. So clearly, um, you're going to be publicizing yourself a lot more because I hadn't heard of you then. So what, just even without the interviews or anything, how, how you can make sure that people hear. And I quite like the Women of the Soil. It sounds very earthy. It sounds as people who are doing, not talking. I have visions of people back bent getting things done, and I like that. So it's a really good, nice um, title, but it needs to be, and I'm sure you, there is a plan to do that once you have some material, needs to be publicized as wide as possible, disseminated as wide as possible. Um, and you know, I, we were talking before the interviews about the fact that a lot of young people from the black and ethnic minority communities in particular, that's what I know about a, a lot of being from that community, don't know our history. They don't know what we've been through, no idea. And I think um, active ways of getting this information over to them that, you know, uh, right here in Manchester, there have been people who've worked hard so that you can have a better life.